I want to remind you of the gospel. This is the good news. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. So he's saying this right here is a big deal. This is the priority. This is really because in, in this in this world, it's really easy to get distracted. It's really easy to get your priorities mixed up and, and start getting your focus and attention on other things and other pursuits and coming to church. And, and it just, but, but let me just remind you, Paul is saying, I love Paul. He planted this church, this Corinthian church, and he's sharing like with the heart of a pastor, really saying, man, don't forget like what's really important here. This is a first importance that Christ died according to the scriptures that he was buried and was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. In your handouts, you guys, that word first importance, um, the Greek word is protos. It's the word protos. And what that means is first, best, superior, or nothing else even comes close. Uh, Paul is saying, look, this is, this is, this is so important. This is, this is the most important information I can give you. This is what is best. This is nothing else comes close to these three things. There is nothing that I could like teach you from on this pulpit that would be of more value. That would be of more importance. That would be more superior than the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in this series, what we're going to do is we're going to teach you why that had to happen. Like, why did Jesus have to die? Why, what happened there? Why did, why did he have to die? And, and what does that mean for us? What did that, what did that, what did that do for, what did that do for us? And then why was Jesus buried? Why was there this delay in, in, in his, in that process there of the resurrection? Why was there a period of silence where people were, the disciples were confused. They were distraught. What was Jesus doing during that time when he was buried spiritually, what is happening and what does God want us to know of first importance about this burial? You don't want to miss that's where we're going next week. And then week number three, the third day is Easter at discovery. And that is the day of his resurrection. What does that mean for us? What did Jesus do? What did he accomplish? And what is that? What does that mean for us? So today we're going to tackle day one, uh, the day of Jesus death Friday. And, and, and it's called Good Friday. Traditionally, it's called Good Friday, not necessarily because it was good for Jesus. Right. It wasn't that good for Jesus. It wasn't a good deal. Just the day before Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. A lot of you know this story. Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and just asking his father, God, if you can let this cup pass from me, if you can get me out of this situation, please get me. I don't want to do this, but yet not my will, but your will be done. Jesus is seen sweating and even so anxious that the Bible says that he was had some blood even coming from his pores. He was he was so like distraught over this day. So it not necessarily was good for him, but the result was good for us. We, we got a good deal. That's why Paul says, let me tell you the good news. I need to remind you of this good news that Jesus died. That's good news for us. And I want to I kind of want to explain why, because without without Jesus death, there is no forgiveness of sins. There isn't. There's no resurrection without a burial or a death. And a lot of times we want that. We want, we want the, the prize without the price, right? We want, we want the success without the cost. And there isn't. There's just no, there, there, actually in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it's not in your notes, but if you want to just jot that down, it, it, the scripture says that the wages of sin or the penalty of sin is what? So, you know, death. is death. There's, there is a, a there is a, a Always sin carries out a result. The, the penalty, the wages, the result of sin will always carry on to its completion, death. That's what it does. That's what sin does. Sin destroys. Sin kills. That's, that's the, the, and, and in fact, in the Old Testament, that's the part of the Bible that records the, the, like thousands of year history, a couple thousand years of how God interacted with mankind, namely the Israelites, the Jewish people. And what God did is he set up the, what's called the priesthood. And there would be these priests that they could... For a season, for a time, make sacrifices to what to cover over, or the biblical word is atone for the sins of the people. So the people never stop sinning. There's always a sin problem, but God made a way for the priests to kill animals. They would they would they would make a sacrifice, shed the blood, and make a sacrifice of an animal, so as to cover over the sin, to atone for the sin of mankind. But they would always have to sacrifice more animals. Come back and sacrifice some more and sacrifice some more because it was just a covering. It was just temporary, but it was always to point the way to Jesus Christ. That there was just a type and a substitute of, of the, the 
spotless and blameless lamb that died for our sins once and for all cleansed and purified of all of our unrighteousness without the without the the death of Christ. There is no forgiveness of sin. So let me teach this to you kind of theologically today, um, just for a, a couple of minutes. Colossians chapter two in your notes, verses 13 and 14, it says you were dead because of your sins. Now, what he's talking about is spiritually. Obviously, you're alive, you're kicking, you're breathing. But what he's talking is about, you're spiritually dead. You're separate from God. Every, every human being is created with three um, layers, if you will, you guys. You have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Your soul is where you get your emotions, your thoughts, your will, your intellect. All that stuff is your emotions. You got that. You have wit. You have a mind. It works. You have emotions. You got that. That's alive. You have a body. That's alive. Some are more alive than others. Come on now. <laughs> Amen. Uh, that's a different message. But you guys got those things going on. But, but apart from Christ, our spirit is dead. That is the part of us that is separate from God and can only be awakened and come alive in Christ. So this is what you were dead, spiritually dead because of your sins. Now, it's important to also note that, that, please listen, your sins don't make you bad. Your sins make you dead. OK, you're not bad. You're not a bad sinner. You ain't no bad. Not there is no bad people. You are creating the image of God with purpose and destiny. God loves you and placed a high value. He paid a high price. For you. That's how much he loves you. Christ went to the cross for you. So sin does not make you bad. You're not a bad person. Sin makes you dead. Sin will always the, the carry. Sin's completion will always be death. You were dead because of your sins. And because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive spiritually with Christ. For he forgave all our sins. And I love this last line. He says he canceled the record of the charges against us so so again let me give you the picture the old testament was a covering and you need to continue to sacrifice animals because people continued to sin it was only a temporary thing but in this new testament in this new relationship we have with god through jesus christ he says i'm gonna let my son take upon your sin once and for all and he will not just cover over your sin he's gonna cancel the record He's going to eradicate it completely. Everything you've ever done or said or thought or evil inclination, all of it is canceled. All the charges against us. And he took it away and nailed it to the cross with Christ. That's, that's what happened. That's why Jesus died. He bore our sins. One verse that's not in your handout, you guys, up here on the screen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. says, while we were spiritually dead... There again, just this death of our spirit separate from Christ in our disobedience. He brought us to life with Christ. It is by God's grace that you have been saved. That's what Jesus does. He makes us spiritually alive when we were spiritually dead. So my question then is, is, is why then? What do we do then when we're not experiencing this inner life that's available to us? What, what do we do when we feel like we're dying on the inside? What do we do when we're experiencing a death of our soul, when there's the circumstances of life and the trials and the difficulties feel like it's pulling life from us? We feel like we're running on empty. When this, uh, I, know I, I know Jesus died. I know Jesus made me alive, but I don't feel, I feel like I'm empty. I'm dry. I feel like I'm even dying on the inside. What do we do when that happens? We're, I'm going to show you very practically what Jesus did on his day one experience, on the day of his greatest suffering. How did Jesus respond to that? And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But, but first, I'd like to talk to you about this, this aspect of suffering. Because every one of us suffer. Every, we're all going to suffer, have suffered, because we live in this world of, of suffering. And, and, I, and I want to kind of enlighten you about suffering a little bit. Kind of give you some understanding. Because I believe that a lot of us have a faulty perspective of suffering. Our thinking is off when it comes to suffering. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the Apostle Paul to help us in this area to understand suffering. Because if there is anyone in the Bible that has the right to teach us about suffering, it's the Apostle Paul. Paul, this guy had to endure, like the Bible says he was hard pressed on every side, that he was constantly in despair and perplexed. I mean, this guy couldn't catch a break. He was like snake bitten, shipwrecked. He was stoned. You know, I'm not talking about the stones you're probably thinking of either. Some of you are like, oh, at least you got a little relief. No, 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 no. 
like stones. He was, he was messed up. This guy had a bad deal. He had it bad, but he never, this guy never lose heart. Never. He always had this joy inside of him. He always had this peace that the world couldn't even understand that he had. I mean, in one point in the Bible, Romans chapter eight says, Paul says, I consider my present sufferings worthless compared to the great riches I'm going to inherit. I mean, this guy, Paul, he inspires me, man. When I read his story and the things that he had to go through and and then I look at my life, I, I look like a crying, whining baby, you know, like, like compared to what this guy and still having joy and peace through it all. Uh, we're going to read a few verses out of first Corinthians, but let me start with first Corinthians chapter one, verse eight. And I want to share with you kind of what Paul has to say about suffering in life. And here again, he's talking to a church he planted and he's talking as a pastor. He says, my friends, I want you to know what a hard time we had in Asia. And I think that's real funny because, because Paul has to remind them of this because at this time actually they were he was he was under some criticism of the church uh, and and so he had to kind of, cuz it's re- it's really easy let me say it this way it's really easy to look at someone else's life and go man I wish I had their life they have it oh look how easy look I wish I had that job I wish I had that house I wish I had that spouse I wish I had man and you don't you Paul is going you don't even know what I had to endure. You don't know the price that was paid, the suffering, the endurance, the patience. You don't know what I had to travel to get to where I am, my friends. Can I just tell you, it's not what you think. That's what he's saying. He's saying, man, it's just, it's, I, I want you to know the hard time I had in Asia. Our sufferings were so horrible and so unbearable that death seems certain. In fact, he says, we felt sure that we were going to die. And maybe you feel, maybe you feel like today you're here and you feel like giving up. Maybe there's something that you've been enduring for a while. There's a trial or a situation and you feel like throwing in the towel today. I want to tell you in the mighty name of Jesus, day one isn't the end of the story. The third day is coming. Amen, somebody? Listen, because of the resurrection, the worst things in life are never the last things. Jesus resurrects our future. Come on, somebody. It's just that's because they're not the worst things are never the last things. Jesus resurrects dead things. He resurrects our future. But there are some things that we need to know about suffering, though, that we need to understand some truths about it that are really going to help you. It's going to help you endure. It's going to help you see with the right perspective what the things that we have to go through in this life. So write these down if you're taking notes, you guys. Number one about suffering that you just have to know is that suffering is inevitable. Suffering is inevitable. If, and if your goal in life is to try to go all throughout life and never anything bad happen to you, then you're setting yourself up for a fall. Okay? It's just, it's not going to happen. In fact, some of you think that God has obligated himself to never let bad things happen to you. To never, like, that's why he's God. He's going to protect me from bad things, protect me from suffering. I mean, that's his job description. He's a, he's a God of miracles, a God of the impossible. He's going to, God never promised that. He never promised to keep suffering off of your doorstep. In fact, he promised the opposite. Man, you didn't know what you enlisted into. No, I'm kidding. John chapter 16, (laughs) verse 33. Jesus says, I told you these things so that in me you would have peace. You ain't going to find very much of it elsewhere. But in me, you have peace. Because in this world, you're going to have what? You're going to have peace. Trouble. Now, nobody, get, I don't get a lot of amens after that verse and stuff. I ain't like, amen, pastor. Hallelujah. Trouble's coming my way. No, no one likes that. But it's, it's truth. And he says, but take heart. I have overcome the world. You see, God's plan was never to take suffering away from you. It was never to take you out of the trial, out of the storm, and out of the difficulty. But in the middle of it, to give you his peace and his power to sustain you through it. That he doesn't cause the calamity. He doesn't cause the suffering. But in the middle of it, he'll provide a rescue plan. He'll be the lifeboat in the middle of that calamity or that. And so it just, it just is, is, you cannot, you guys, it's inevitable. It's inevitable. You can't get away from it. Here's the second thing we need to know about suffering. And that is suffering is unpredictable. It's unpredictable, meaning you can't plan for it. You can't. Now, you might be able to discern it coming, if you, have, if you use wisdom and discernment, you might be able to, to, to discern suffering coming. You go, you know what, I'm not going to make that decision 
that's going to, I'm going to suffer. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to do that. And so you may be able to discern your way from suffering and, and alter course away, away from it. But, but sometimes suffering just, just comes on you. It just, it just, and sometimes it comes at the worst times. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, man. We're in the middle of selling our house right now. We're trying to sell our house. And everything now is going wrong with our house. I mean, it was fine. It used to be fine. It's just, it was like the toilets were working for seven years. Are you kidding me? The sink was fine for seven years. And now there's a crack. And I'm like, what is, it's just like one thing after the other. That's what kind of, it happens. To, and that's what actually Jeremiah says in chapter four, verse 20. He says, disaster follows disaster. It like attracts more disaster. Disaster does somehow one right after the other. The whole land lies in ruins. In an instant, my tents are destroyed. My shelter in a moment. It's like this constant battery. And you just need to know that you can't predict. Nor do you want to live your life in fear of them. In fear of suffering or in in protection mode of suffering. Like you try to insulate your life and protect your kids and insulate your kids. I'm telling you, you're setting yourself up for failure. You're setting your kids up. Up a failure if you don't, because they're un, they're just unpredictable. Here's the third thing: suffering is impartial. It's impartial. It, suffering doesn't matter how much you make, or how educated you are, or where you live. It just suffering is is impartial. People always ask the famous question: Why me? Why me? And and I'm, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in, in just a moment. But I would just say to you: Why not you? Right? Why not you? Why do you think that you're any different from the rest of us living in this world? Like you're going to be spared from the trouble and the suffering of this world. It's just, you say, well, I didn't do anything wrong. Why does this have to happen to me? The truth is, the Bible says, Matthew 5, 45, that God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, what you're going through is something all of us have to go through. You're no different. We all have to suffer. We all have to endure the same things. And sometimes, let me just set some theology straight right here. Because it is human nature, when we go through something and we have suffering or a trial in our life, to try to connect it to, well, what did I do wrong? That's just human nature to go, to, we're, we're, something happens and we go, wow, well, why, why is this happening to me? What did, I, what did I do? They did it in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, there was this man who was born blind, and the disciples were walking by with Jesus. And he said, oh, Jesus, who sinned? Someone must have sinned here. Was it him or his parents? They didn't give Jesus any other option at all. It was just, who sinned, Jesus, him or his parents? He's blind. And Jesus tells him straight up. He says, your theology's messed up. That's not, that's not what's going on here. He just told him straight up. He said, he said no, no, this, this happened so that the Son of Man would be glorified. That's an, it's an opportunity for me to be glorified. That's why this happened. See, we don't see our sufferings the same way God sees them. We're not looking at them through the same lens. Sometimes God is saying, hey, that, that suffering you're going through is an opportunity for me to be glorified. It's, a, it's an opportunity for your character to be formed, for your faith to be fortified. It's an opportunity because I'm about to do a miracle in your life and, and just establish your steps. This here is an opportunity for me to get some glory from your life. We just don't see it from the same perspective. It's, in, it's impartial, though. Suffering is in, impartial. Here's the last thing I want you to understand about suffering. Because the first three were, were um, you know, they weren't too happy. Okay, let me give you some good news, right? Here's, and you're going you're gonna to like this one. Suffering is temporary. Come on, somebody. Yeah, it's temporary. It never feels like it, though. Okay, let me just say it. it just, when you're going through it, it feels like it's forever. It feels like it's not going to end in the middle of it. And what you're going through right, right now, I, I know, I know it feels so long and I know it feels, you know, so hard. And most of us get to the point where we want to just give up. But can I tell you, it's temporary. It is temporary. And as sure as I'm standing here, I know I'm on assignment from God to encourage you and speak some life into you today and speak this verse over your life. Hebrews chapter 10, a powerful verse says, so do not throw away your confidence because it will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere. Turn to your neighbor and tell them you need to persevere. Come on, turn to them. They need to hear that today. You need to persevere so that. When you've done the will of God, you see, there's a will of God, even in the middle of this, I'm telling you, I'm going to show you, I'm going to help you see today the will of God 
even in the middle of your suffering. He says, hey, even in the middle of it, there's a will of God. When you do the will of God, you will receive what he has promised for in just a little while. And it won't ever feel like just a little while. It's going to feel like a long while. He who is coming will come and not delay. And it goes on today to say that the righteous will live by faith and they won't shrink back and they won't get to this place where they say, you know what? I'm just going to give up. I can't take it anymore. No, they press through it. And I'm telling you, church, whatever, whatever's going on in your business, whatever's going on in your marriage and your emotions and your tragedy or your troubles or whatever suffering that's surrounding your life right now, hang in there. The third day is coming church. It's coming. It's never the end of the story. This is what Paul had to say in the middle of his suffering. And I want you to see it, you guys. Uh, I read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Let me, let me continue his thought in verse 9 and 10. He says this in verse 9. But this suffering, this made us stop trusting in ourselves and start trusting in God. You see, sometimes God allows you to get knocked flat on your back so you can finally be looking in the right direction. Yeah, oh, we don't we it, 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 some, some of us takes that to get our attention. He said, this made us man. I, I was put in a situation where I could not handle it myself. I couldn't do it in my own strength, in my own power. I had to stop trusting in myself and my own abilities to take care of this. And I had to look to God who raises the dead to life. I got some dead things in my life. I got some things that need the breath of God that need to be resurrected. They're broken and I just can't do it. I need to look to God. He's the only one who can raise the dead back to life. God saved us from the threat of death and we are sure that he will do it. What? Again and again. Man, God's going to do it again, church. Now there's four things. There's four things that I I want you to, to, that you need to do when you're in what I'm calling the dead zone. Four things. When you're in that dead zone, when you're in that place where you feel like you're dying on the inside and life has just demanded too much of you and the circumstances have kind of sucked you dry. What do you do when you're not experiencing that life? When you feel like you're dying on the inside, there's four things that you need to do that Jesus did. We're going to go back to the cross right now. And Jesus day one experience on Friday. What did Jesus do in the, in the worst day of his life in the, in the moment where he suffered No greater than on this day. What did he do? And we're going to find some application here and what you and I can do. And I'm telling you, you do these four things. I'm telling you, man, you're going to you're going to come at the end of this victorious in Jesus name. Amen, church. Amen. Amen. All right. Write these down. I'm going to give you the points first. Then we're going to look to look, look to the cross. Number one. First thing we need to do when we're in the dead zone is talk to God. We got to talk to God. Now, I've told you this before, church. I'm going to tell you again. Prayer needs to become your first defense, not your last resort. It just, it just needs to be. You need to get to that place where you have this discipline and an instinct to cry out to God, to, to turn to him. Don't wait to get knocked on your rear end to start looking to God. Like, turn to him now. Let it be your first defense, not the last resort. Jesus, um, here we see him suffering on the cross, and he's asking the same question. That a lot of us kind of ask when we're suffering in Matthew 27. He says, my God, my God, why is this happening? Why? Why have you forsaken me? This is Jesus again. He was fully human, fully divine, expressing some of his humanness here. And and, because at this moment, at this moment, he was literally forsaken. There was a forsakenness. The Bible says that he became sin for us. That he became every wrong action every bad thought you've ever had every wrong motivation every every evil every sin that i've ever committed and will commit jesus embodied in this one moment and the father was pleased to have it paid upon his son and in that moment god turned his back because the wages of sin is death and so jesus was forsaken so you and i would never have to be forsaken That's why. And and so so he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And and, and even in that, I'm not, I don't have time to go to Psalm 22, but he's actually quoting a Psalm in Psalm chapter 22. And and, and in this Psalm, it actually explains in detail how Jesus was going to die. It's really amazing. It's really, you, you should go read Psalm 22. So even in this moment, Jesus is not only crying out to God, but he's quoting scripture and pointing to the direction of the Messiah 
And if you're wondering why, you're, why your prayer life may be suffering, maybe it's because you don't, you're not in your word. You don't have a promise to stand on or a truth to declare. Okay, somebody? All right, but we need to turn to God and talk. He says, my God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? It's the why question. It's human nature to ask this question. And, and it's because we have this misconception that if we knew the reason why we were suffering, that it would somehow ease our pain. And it never does. It will never ease the pain if we just have the, the reason for it. Because you don't need an explanation. You need strength. You don't need an explanation. You need, you need support. You don't need an explanation. You need a savior. That's what you need. You need a savior in the middle of that situation. Um, but we're always looking for an explanation. We ask questions like, why, why did they walk out on me? Why did, why did she have to leave me? Why did they have to die? Why did I have to get sick? Why did I have to lose my job? Why did, why did this have to happen? Listen, guys, I've been studying the why question for years. And I'm going to give you my educated pastoral answer to the why question. I don't know. Okay. That's just, you know why? Cause I'm not God. All right. And neither are you. And, 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 and there's going to be things that we just will not understand on this earth. But when we get to heaven, God will make it very clear to us. Only God knows a lot of things. The reason why some things happen. Listen, and if you don't get the reason and the answer quickly, you might as well just move away from the why question. Cause all you're doing is prolonging your pain. And some of you haven't moved from that place of suffering, not because healing and life is available to you, but because you're still asking why, why? And you're prolonging the pain. And if all, if all your prayers are, are petitions and requests and why God, then you're going to be very disappointed in your prayer life. Cause, cause prayer is, is not meant to be your tool to get answers. It's not, prayer is not meant to be like the, that, that instrument we use to talk to God just to get answers. No, we talk to God to get his heart. That's why we talk to God. Not to, not to find the reasons why, but to get his heart in the matter. You see, on one, on one hand, when you talk to God for the reason why, you're sitting on a foundation of distrust. God, why? Why? I don't understand it. I don't get this, God. It's not what I would choose. It's not what I want. I need an explanation, God. It's on a foundation of distrust. On the other hand, when we go to God to seek his heart, it's the same kind of, God, I don't understand why. I don't get it, God, why this is happening to me. But I need your heart in the middle of this. Can I get your heart in the middle of this? Because I don't understand, God. One is on a foundation of distrust, and the other is on a foundation of trust. Philippians chapter 4 says, Do not be anxious about anything. Man, don't let anxiety grip you in the middle of this storm. In the middle of this suffering or that trial. Don't let that anxiety grip you. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition. Now God, he he wants you to cry out to him. Cry out to God. Ask God. Petition God. But he says, prayer and petition with thanksgiving. You know what that means? That means we thank him before he's ever responded with the answer. Just start thanking God for what he's already doing, for what he's already done. You thank God in advance for the answer. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. And look at this. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God says, hey, if you ask me like that, I'll give you my peace. I'll give you my heart. I'll guard your heart and your mind if you ask me like that. Talk to God. Talk to God. That's where we got to start. Talk to God. Then number two. This is important. Very important point that Jesus shows us as well. Don't take it out on those closest to you. See, when you're suffering, when you're hurting, the easiest thing to do is to hurt others. Hurt people, hurt people. Isn't that true? It's just, it's just easy because I'm hurting. It's so easy to inflict wound on other people. It, it, they call this, the actual official term for this is called stress rolling. It's when we're under stress or duress, we just kind of roll it down on the people that are closest to us. And the cause for the stress is always the same. You experience a situation that, that you feel overwhelmed or confused, and you're too afraid to express your true feelings. You have no environment, no outlet to express your true feelings. And here's the problem with that. Your feelings, feelings never want to stay hidden. They're always pushing 
against like it's like a dam a water in a dam they're always just pushing against trying to break out trying to find a crack in there or even to burst out of that thing and it will always burst out in the places in the dam that are least defense that are of the least defense and that place is the people we trust the most so we trust them the most and there's the crack and sometimes it and that's why that's why the most upstanding citizens the most you know seemingly great christians never can Shout at anybody or yell at anybody publicly, but behind closed doors can yell and scream curses at their spouse or at their kids. Why? Because they never they never dealt with it. It's they it happens. This happens with the people you love and you trust the most when you don't deal with it properly. Jesus shows us in John 19 that he kind of he had a he had a different different um outlet than us on this he had a healthy outlet he didn't let his suffering and his hurts roll on to the people around him even at his worst day look what he said near the cross of jesus stood his mother his mother's sister mary the wife of clopas and mary magdalene when jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby and that's john he said to his mother dear woman here is your son and woman right there is a sign of respect in those times it would have been like saying ma'am he was be, he's not being disrespectful. He's saying he's being very honoring to his mom. He's saying, ma'am, and to the disciple, here's your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. You see, in the, in the middle of his pain, he sees his mom who's crying and broken. And he gets out of himself a little bit. And he sees the, the heart of his of, of mom who cared for him and fed him and and watched him scrape his knees. And, and, and in the moment of his suffering, he sees mom's suffering. And I don't know about you, but I'm not thinking about, mo- I'm not thinking about anybody else in the middle, middle of my pain. I'll just be honest. I'm bad at this. I get the worst man colds ever. Okay? Let me know what I'm talking about. You know what a man cold is? A man cold is, it's a normal cold. Okay? It's just a normal cold for women. The man gets it, and it's the end of the world. Okay? <laughs> I get bad because men usually, we usually have two, we don't, we don't, we have two extremes here. We're either fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Or, or I'm dying. (laughs) Dying. We don't have, we don't have, I'm not feeling that well. I got a little fever. I need to go see a doctor. I need antibiotics. We don't got none of that stuff. We just got, I'm fine and I'm dying, honey. Give me a glass of water. Can you get me this? Can you get, I'm just here. I'll tell you, be honest, man. I'm bad. I am a bad person when it comes to being sick i just not thinking about the other knees i'm thinking about my own knees man and it, it tradition shows or tells us that mary lived another 12 years and, and during that time john took her john took her on as his very own because of this statement jesus makes and it's and it's so hard in the middle of our suffering to be aware of those who are closest to us we tend to forget about others in the middle all it takes a little toothache a little headache or a migraine or something then we're just irritable and frustrated and we just stress roll that onto other people and we usually hurt the people that are closest to us we think you know what they can take it i can i can outlet onto them i can just roll onto because that's what they're supposed they'll automatically absorb the problem how many, how many of you just come home from a bad day you didn't yell you didn't get upset over here but you come home you let down your guard and you take it out on your kids or you take it out on your spouse. And maybe you don't anger. Maybe you don't hit anybody or yell. But maybe what you do is you say, I just need some time. Come on, I'm talking to you guys. I just need, I just, I need some time. You can go to your man cave or your little hole or something. And, 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 you, and you don't fulfill the role. You're supposed to care for them through that. You're supposed to protect them through that. And you come home and you got to isolate yourself. because you, you, know you know why you're this, we take it out on the people closest to us? You know why? I'll tell you why. Because you didn't do step number one. Because you didn't talk to God. You, we never got God's heart in the middle of it, in the middle of that suffering. We never paused. We never looked to the source. We never asked God for help and to get his heart. And so we just transmitted our trauma onto the people we love the most. And I'm telling you, in the middle, in the middle of your suffering, you need to learn how to talk to God and don't take it out on the people you love the most. Here's the third point. I'm going to tell you right up front, though, that this one doesn't make a lot of sense. In the middle of your suffering, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But I'm telling you, this one, there's, uh, it's a powerful truth that in the middle of your dead zone, if you do number three, meet needs around you. 
meet needs around you. I know it seems weird. It's like, who? I need it. I need my needs met. How am I going to? Listen, God will intentionally, strategically put like sufferers around you while you're suffering as an instrument of comfort for you. So that you would you would reach out, that you would give life and life will come back to you. You give life and life comes back to you. You give life, you give comfort and comfort comes back to you. Most of you know that Jesus was hung on the cross between two criminals. Between two he was ex- these criminals were experiencing the exact same suffering that Jesus was experiencing. Let's look at it. Luke chapter 23. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Are you the Christ? Save yourself and us while you're at it. You know, he's trying to get at Jesus's pride. Like, you, you ain't the Christ. Go ahead and save yourself. And while you're doing it, save us too. Okay? There's, there's a type of person that when they're suffering, they try to make everyone else around them suffer. That's this thief right here. While I'm suffering, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make sure everyone else around me is not feeling good either. Is suffering with me. Because if I'm, I'm taking people down with me. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus, and if I was Jesus, I would have answered, you ain't getting lit. You, you sorry, sat, you, 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 how dare you? You know, I would have, if it was me, I would have been like, what do you mean? I would have just been like, uh, but, but Jesus responds in the middle of his suffering. He says, you know what? I can, I, yeah, I'm hurting too, but I can, I can ease his suffering. I can, I can ease this man's pain. And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth today. You'll be with me in paradise. It's the last thing we usually think of. We think we need help. How in the world can I give help? Or some of us believe the lies about ourselves and we disqualify ourselves in the middle of when we're going through. I see it all the time. People go through a tragedy or a trial or some type of suffering or storm and they peel back away. and They say, no, I just I just can't. How am I going to in, in the middle of this kind of give life away when I don't even have any life in me? Did it ever dawn on you? The reason why you don't have life in you is because you're not giving it away. That we need we need to help Others, God will strategically put like sufferers around you. And when you do that, I'm telling you, you're going to get distracted from your own dead zone. And and God is calling us to meet fellow strugglers right where they are. Something powerful happens when you do that. And then here, let me give you the fourth thing you need to do when you're in the dead zone. And this one here, man, I'm, I'm just telling you, this is this is why Jesus died. This is why he died, was buried, and rose from the grave right here. If you can figure this one out, number four, live from the Spirit. See, we walk in the natural. We walk in the flesh. We we kind of interpret life through the senses of our flesh, through the sense of our feelings and what we see and what we feel. And so because it's, because it's tragedy out here, I'm suffering on the inside. I feel like I'm dying on the inside. And, in, and we, we walk naturally. But the Bible tells us, God calls us to walk in the spirit, to experience life from your inner man, he calls it, to interpret life from not your senses, but from the spirit that God has awakened through Christ. Something inside of you and you can live from, you can walk from that space of your spirit. Let me show you why this is important. John 6, 63 says the spirit gives what? The spirit gives life. See this flesh, these senses count for nothing. The spirit alone gives life. Listen, your circumstances changing will not give you life. Your marriage changing will not give you life. Your financial outlook changing will not give you life. Your health changing will not give you life. It is the spirit alone that gives life. And Jesus says the words that I've spoken to you, they're full of the spirit and life. Because of Jesus' death, you have been made alive. There is a spirit of life living inside of you. There's a life-giving spirit calling from within you that when you learn how to walk within and live within this 
the spirit that God has deposited in you, it doesn't matter what's going on around. Not, I'm not minimizing your trials or your suffering. I'm saying there still is going to be patient endurance that is necessary through that. But in order to get through it with joy and peace, you got to live from the spirit. The spirit alone gives life. He says the flesh counts for nothing. Could it be that the reason why we're even experiencing suffering is because like Paul, it, that it's to make us stop trusting in ourselves and start trusting in God. Who raises the dead to life. Let me close with this scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 16. It says. That is why. We never give up. Hey I'm speaking to you today. Some, some of you are here today. And you're ready to give up on something. You're ready to throw in the towel on something. And God is not finished with it yet. You might be. And you're ready to throw it in. But it's, God says. Nah, that, that is why. We never give up. Though our bodies are dying. See, the situations are still bleak. We live in a dying world. We live in a a world of suffering and sin. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed day by day. And you can, you can live from this place of your spirit, of life, of joy, of peace. And it doesn't matter, honestly, what is going on around you. If you can walk, live by the spirit. And that's why Jesus died, to make your spirit alive, that you can live by the spirit. Go ahead and bow your heads all across this worship center with me, guys. Some of you are here today and you are, uh, you know, you feel it. You feel like you're so far away from God. You feel, you sense God in this moment because you were created with this spirit that is dormant and can only come alive in Christ. So right now, I know that it's getting breathed on just right now. But you would kind of say, like, I feel far away from God. And like we're talking about in the beginning, that that, that, that sin separates us from God. And there's a distance that was created. And really, you can't do anything about that. You can't close the gap. The only way to come into a relationship with God, the only way to be alive spiritually is by surrendering your life to Jesus. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is our Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. You will be made alive in your spirit. Some of you here today and you need that. With every head bowed and eye closed, you need that. You need the spirit of life inside of you. You need to be awakened in your inner man. And that can happen today by faith. With every head bowed and eye closed, if that's you and you know that you want, you're apart from God today, maybe You've never really prayed this prayer or really asked Jesus to come into your life. Or maybe you have and, and just you kind of let the gap happen again and separation happen again. Today, I want to pray for you a prayer of salvation, a prayer of surrender. And I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out. I just want to pray with you right where you're seated so that God can awaken you. Can, so that your spirit can come alive in Christ today. With every head bowed and eye closed, if that's you and you're ready for a fresh start clean slate the record and the charges canceled against you come on with every head bowed eye closed you lift up your hand lift it high say pastor pray for me i need that i want that i want to be born again i want to be made alive leave it up yes 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 amen come on yeah 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 yes amen 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 all over yeah yeah keep it up yes yes praise god yeah yeah all over this place thank you jesus yes praise god yeah yeah praise god Go ahead and put it down. Put it down for just a moment. Just whisper these, this prayer with me. <laughs> Touch God with your heart in this, you guys. Make it your own. Say, God, forgive me of my sins. I know they separated me from you. So today, I surrender the control of my life to you. Come live inside of me. Awaken me. Holy Spirit, thank you. Jesus, I declare you're my Lord. And my Savior, cleanse me and make me brand new. God, I speak that over every person right now. That we would live by the Spirit, Lord. That that maybe the circumstances aren't going to change today. Maybe the trial doesn't immediately change today. But what's going to change right now is how I'm interpreting my trials. I'm going to stop letting those things influence me. And I'm going to live by the power of your Spirit inside of me. I am an overcomer in Christ. 
I am more than a conqueror. I am victorious because you were victorious, God. And I thank you for that right now. God, help us in the middle of our suffering to just turn to you. To stop looking to ourselves. And to put all of our hope and all of our trust in you, God. Help us to stop taking it out on the people we love the most. But to protect them. To care for them. God, we need. there are some other strugglers that are around us. And God, you've called us to meet needs. To meet the needs around us. So help us, God, get outside of our comfort zone. And, and start to give life so life can come back. And comfort others so that we can be comforted. God, help us to meet needs around us. God, use us in a powerful way. And I thank you for it right now. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, if you receive that, give God some praise today, church.